What if I told you that at death you have no thoughts, no memory, no knowledge of anything beyond the grave? Would you believe me? What if I told you that your life is composed of physical elements that decompose and return to the dust of the earth and that at death there are no thoughts that survive? Would you be confused? And what if I said you did not have an immortal soul that lives on either in a place called hell or heaven? Would that challenge you? Well, stay tuned. We have a number of challenges for your cherished assumptions on this edition of Beyond Today as we address the myth of the immortal soul. Join our host, Darius McNeely, and his guests as they help you understand your future on Beyond Today. As a minister, I am often called upon to conduct funerals. At a time of death, friends and family come together to remember the life of the deceased. I have always found that a time when the living come to the house of mourning to seek understanding. They are wondering about life's meaning and why death is such a tragic part of life and what happens at death. It is this last question that seems most on people's minds. Most people believe or want to believe that there is some part of us that lives on when we die. We cannot accept that this physical life is all there is. Since the beginning has always been this way, Virtually every civilization has held a belief that something of this life transcends death. It is embodied in the belief of the immortality of the soul, the idea that man has a spiritual soul housed in the body that is released at death. The idea of an immortal soul is best seen among the ancient Egyptians and the elaborate customs they created to preserve the body and provide for the soul in its journey into the afterlife. The pyramids of Egypt are the oldest surviving testament to this idea of the afterlife. Elaborate drawings in the tombs depicted this belief. They show the way the soul would depart from this life and go to the life beyond. They mummified the body to preserve the physical. Food was buried with them along with clothing and weapons to assist the departed soul on its journey into the next life. But it is not just the Egyptians. Cultures from China to North America buried their dead in ways that show a belief in a soul that departs the body at death and lives on in another world. It's a universal belief. This belief is so important that it ranks as the fundamental question for theologians and philosophers. It centers on the question of what is a human being. Is man merely an animal, the highest form of life that has evolved on this planet? Or is he a unique being created for the special purpose by a creator God? If man has a soul that is immortal from some previous point of existence, then you must do something with that soul when it dies. That has led to other fundamental beliefs in the afterlife, ideas like a heaven, or a hell, or a purgatory. But we have to ask where these ideas came from. Do they come from tradition, or from a divinely revealed source? On this program, we take the Holy Bible as the source of understanding on these questions. We're not afraid to tackle all the questions that surround the issue, but we look to the Bible as the standard for our teaching. We think you should, too. With me to discuss this question of the immortality of the soul is Don Henson, a writer and a pastor. Let's get right to it, Don. If man is immortal, what is the real origin of this idea of the immortal soul? As you pointed out, the belief in the immortality of the soul is virtually universal. It goes through every religion and, of course, including Christianity. But interestingly, the source of the teaching of the immortality of the soul does not come from the Bible, even though it's a very cherished belief of most Christians. However, the Bible does reveal to us the origin of that teaching. In Genesis, the second chapter, after God had created Adam, he told Adam that he was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and if he did that, then he would die. In the very next chapter, the, the serpent comes on the scene, uh, the devil or Satan comes on the scene, and he is speaking to Eve, who also has been given that same warning not to eat of that tree, and he tells Eve that if you eat of that tree, you will not surely die. And so right from the very beginning, we have the introduction of a contradiction here that, that Satan is deceiving Eve into believing that she is or that she, that she will not die even if she were to partake of that tree. So this first episode from the scriptures that really gives us a, a background into the origins of human life really is the first place where we're going to find this idea 
beginning to be put out. Exactly. The, the belief or the false teaching about the immortality of the soul goes back to the very first human beings. So we can say that's the first lie. That was, that was the first lie. All right. Why would Satan tell this lie? Why not something else? Well, in, in Revelation chapter 12, we're told that Satan is the one who has deceived all the nations. So Satan has told a multitude of lies in order to, to deceive and confuse mankind. But this particular lie, the first one that he told, was in fact a brilliant stroke, a brilliant lie because of all the confusion that it has caused. You see, God the Father and Jesus Christ are working out a plan for mankind. Mm -hmm. And it is a plan by which, or through which, God wants to give man the gift of eternal life. And so Satan... But it's, but it's something that God gives to man. Exactly. That, not that's something what the, that he has. But yes, you're exactly right. It's something that God has promised or wants to give to mankind. So what Satan does from the very beginning is to convince mankind that he already is immortal. And from that, then, all of their understanding about God, about the purpose of life, about what salvation is, it all becomes confused and muddled because we think we already have immortality. And not only that, as, as you pointed out, once Satan has built that foundation, that false premise of immortality, then you build on that all the false teachings such as heaven and hell and purgatory and, and, uh, and reincarnation. All this confusion muddles up the reality of what God is really doing. I can see that because if man is a soul or has, is an immortal soul, already has uh, the spirit essence there that uh, lives beyond death, then you've got to put it someplace. You've got to either put it in a heaven or a hell or a holding place, yes. which is yes. uh, kind of like the idea that, that purgatory talks about. Uh, it's almost one lie builds on another. That's right. It is that foundation. It's the false premise. At the beginning, when I, we started to talk, I almost misspoke in raising the question whether if there is an immortal soul. Let me just go directly to that then. Do humans have an immortal soul? In a word, no. And, and again, that's very clear from the very creation account itself. See, when God created Adam, he formed Adam from the dust, from the clay, from the earth, and formed and fashioned and shaped his body. And then it says that God breathed into him the breath of life. In other words, God provided life. He animated. He, he brought to life this, this physical creation that he had, that he had built. Uh, but it does not say that man was given an immortal soul. It says that man became a living being. Now, in the Hebrew, the word living being is from the Hebrew word nephesh. And it's very interesting that the this, same... This will be the only Hebrew we have for okay. the audience today, right? <laughs> That's all I know. So it's going to be the whole okay. we have to deal with. But uh, it is the Hebrew word nephesh, which means a living creature. And it's interesting that it, earlier in Genesis chapter 1, the, the land animals and the sea animals are called living creatures, are called creatures, and it's the same Hebrew word. And so we are a living creature in the same sense that the animal creation is also a living creature. So he, the, the, the idea is that man then became a soul. Exactly. Not that he, he already had a soul. He became a living soul. And that's what the passage says, that, that Adam became a living soul, became a nephesh. And so the, uh, the, the belief then that that's an immortal life of some form is, is simply a, uh, an, an assumption or a misreading of the Scripture. Because you see, in the same context, God also goes on, as we've already mentioned, to tell Adam that if he takes of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then he will die. That the gift of life that God had given to him would be taken away, and he would no longer exist. He and, would no longer be living. Death is the opposite of immortality. Yes. We've got a lot to cover on this particular subject. If man is mortal, and when he dies is dead all over, then what about those who have what are called near-death experiences? We'll answer that in this program when we return. Stay with us. People all over the world ponder, is there a heaven or a hell? Can we be sure there's even eternal life? Billions of people don't want to think that they or anybody should have to burn forever. Would such a God be fair to believe in if countless people who don't believe as they do must suffer torture forever? Get the answers in your free copy of Heaven and Hell, What Does the Bible Really Teach? Call toll for you one 888 or go to beyondtoday.tv. 
Understand from the Bible, nobody goes to ever-burning hell at death, and where the idea of the immortal soul comes from, from outside the Bible. Call toll-free 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Or go to beyondtoday.tv for your free copy of Heaven and Hell, What Does the Bible Really Teach? And we are back to Beyond Today. We're challenging one of your most important beliefs, perhaps, that of the idea of the immortality of the soul on today's program, the myth of the immortality of the soul. Our featured booklet is one that we have prepared, Heaven and Hell, What Does the Bible Really Teach? We said in the beginning that with the idea of the immortality of the soul, you've got to do, you've got to do something with that soul. You've got to either put it in heaven or hell or some other holding place if indeed man does have a soul. This booklet goes into a lot more detail than we're going to be able to cover in this program, answering many of the questions some of you are probably already beginning to ask about various scriptures, various ideas from the Bible. This booklet will go into it in more detail. You can go online at beyondtoday.tv to order your copy of it. Don, let's get back to this. You left last uh, segment. We were talking about this idea of the, of, uh, the Hebrew word nephesh and the idea of a, that uh, meaning that man becomes a soul, a living, breathing being. There's a scripture in Leviticus chapter 17 that talks about the idea that the life is in the flesh, the life is in the flesh and in the blood. Uh, the word that is used there for life is the word nephesh, the same word that's used for soul in Genesis where you were quoting it, which means a living, breathing being. Does that mean that our blood is immortal then in, in that sense? And if a person's losing blood, are they losing their soul because of really the meaning that comes out there? Well, you know, in the first place, we've already established that nephesh means a living being and that a nephesh can die. So the answer to your question is no, our blood is not immortal. Our blood is and not... The soul is not in the blood. The soul, even, correct. Even though the life is in the blood. Correct. Well, obviously, we need to have blood. We need to have blood circulating through our bodies in order to sustain life. And that's the point of, of the life uh, being in the blood. Uh, so it, it does not have anything to do with uh, any, any part of a of, of soul that lives on or in some ways immortal or separate from the body. Your blood is part of your body. It's mm -hmm. part of what God fashioned and created out of the dust of the earth. And it is, it is mortal. It is, it is part of our, our, of, our, of our body. And so there's no life in the blood itself. Uh, this, this instruction is given in the context of God telling his people how he wants to be worshipped, how they right. should make sacrifices to him. And it's in contrast to others who would sacrifice animals and, and even humans to their God, and in some cases would drink the blood of that sacrifice. Uh, it, they believed that it would somehow give them more power, more strength. They would take the life of the other creature or, or man into themselves, and it was somehow supposed to be beneficial to them. Well, since life is sacred and God has given us life, uh, he is telling us not to, to abuse that, uh, that understanding of life by uh, drinking the blood and thinking that you're gaining something in some mysterious way from it. So even though it's the same word that is translated soul in, in there, the, it, it's, again, not connected with the idea of, of uh, the, immortal, the immortal soul that a That's person correct. has. That's right. Don, let's get into some of the background of this. It's important people understand how it became such a prevalent belief. How did this idea of an immortal, immortal soul become such a, a prominent idea that stuck with people? Well, we go back historically, and we'll get into a little bit of historical detail here without hopefully getting too detailed. But as you pointed out in the introduction to the program, uh, the belief in an afterlife is, is very deeply embedded in virtually every religion, and you cited the Egyptians' religion as an example. They have a very involved and intricate belief in what happens after death and preparation for the afterlife. Well, the Greek philosopher Socrates studied the Egyptians' teaching on that subject and came to believe it, came to believe those, what, what the Egyptians taught about the immortality of the soul. Now, Socrates was a, a prominent Egyptian philosopher. Greek philosopher. Greek philosopher, Yes, sorry. and he studied the Egyptian religion and culture, and he, he adopted it. And uh, much of the, what subsequent philosophy that, that the world embraced was from, originated with Socrates. For example, Plato was one of his most famous students, and he also embraced and, and, and defined death in one of his writings as the separation of the immortal soul from the body. 
Now, that's almost a direct quote from the way a Christian would define death mm-hmm. or the, the separation of the body and from the immortal soul. And so the, the origin of the teaching goes to the Egyptians, to Socrates, and then he taught it to Plato. Plato to his students, Aristotle, for example, continued also to, to in, in, embrace that same teaching. Uh, later, when the Greek civilization began to fade, the Roman civilization came on the scene. Their philosophers also adopted it. The, the, the poet Virgil, as an example, right. uh, wrote of the same. And so what you see is this, this trail, the, these, this, this line of historical uh, development and adoption of this ancient pre-Christian belief about the immortality of the soul that comes into the, the philosophies and the understanding or the, what, what people in, in our civilization began to accept. Well, then what did exactly Christ and the New Testament writers like Paul teach about the soul and the nature of man? Well, it's, it's very important to consider that because they were the earliest Christian fathers and Christian writers, those who, were, who literally wrote the New Testament or the story of Christ being in the Gospel accounts. Let me give you three very quick examples. First of all, Jesus Christ in Matthew 19. A young man came to him and said, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus, when he answered that question, did not say, Oh, wait a minute. You already have eternal life. It's just a question of where you're going to spend it. Mm -hmm. When Jesus answered that question, he said, if you will enter into life, here is what you must do. So life was something that was going to be, had to be given to him. Exactly. And both the young man who understood that himself and Jesus Christ explained it in those terms. You have to do something in order to receive that eternal life. Another example would be the apostle Peter. In the first chapter of his first epistle, mm-hmm. he writes of this, this, this wonderful gift or, or promise of salvation that is reserved for us. And he points out in that context, in the first chapter, that we will receive it at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, at the time of his return. So from that, we can understand that we do not go off to our reward when we die that it doesn't happen in that, in that way. It's something we await until Christ returns and then we receive it. And then a third example, uh, and there are many others, but just one more I will mm-hmm. share for now, is in Romans chapter 6, where Paul makes a very interesting statement, one that many are familiar with. He says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, what we have earned by our sinfulness, by our actions, is death. Which, by the way, is exactly what God told Adam. That you would die. That he would die. Into this tree you will die. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so that teaching is, is, quite, is very consistent that you will die if you, uh, if you sin. If you, but if you, the gift of God is eternal life. It's the last half of that verse that most people will quote and remember. That's right. We need to receive eternal life. It's not something we already have. But it has a very important application for this understanding about the nature of man and whether or not he has an immortal soul. That's right. Eternal life is a gift from God. It is. There's a lot more to to cover about this subject. Our featured book at this time is Heaven and Hell, What Does the Bible Really Teach? You can go online at beyondtoday.tv to order your own copy. When we come back, we're going to talk about whether or not this is all there is to life. When the lights go out, is there nothing more for you or your loved ones who have died? And what about those who have claimed to have had near-death experiences? Before you answer with what you've always thought, stay with us. When we return, we'll show from the Bible what happens to the soul at death. People all over the world ponder, is there a heaven or a hell? You need to understand from the Bible that nobody goes to an ever-burning hell at death. And where does the idea of the immortal soul come from? Call toll-free 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Or go to beyondtoday.tv for your free copy of Heaven and Hell, What Does the Bible Really Teach? While the news about the Middle East seems to get worse, you can get understanding of where it's going in your free subscription to the Good News magazine. See why Jerusalem will remain at the center of the news in articles that regularly keep you up to date in the direction of our world. Call toll-free 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Or go to beyondtoday.tv for your free subscription to the Good News magazine. 
And we are back to Beyond Today. We are talking today about the myth of the immortal soul. Our featured booklet is Heaven and Hell, What Does the Bible Really Teach? You can go online and order a copy of this at beyondtoday.tv. It goes into a lot more detail than we are able to go into in this program and answers a lot of questions that I know that you have. When you subscribe to that booklet or order that booklet, you will get a free subscription to the Good News Magazine, our flagship publication Every other month, six issues a year, will begin to come to you as well, articles dealing with other biblical topics such as this, uh, Christian Living, Bible Prophecy, a very important magazine for you. All right, Don, we've been emphasizing that contrary to what most people believe, the Bible makes it clear that man doesn't have an immortal soul. But if that's true, then and is that, we have to ask the question, is that all there is? And what does the Bible really say about death? What does the Bible describe about human life? The Bible is very consistent in describing life as being t- brief and temporary. For example, in the, in the 90th Psalm, life is described as grass that grows up during the day, and by the end of the day it withers or is, is cut down. Uh, in James 4, we're told that life is, is but a vapor, and it's just kind of a puff of smoke, and it's barely visible, and barely just such a short time uh, that it's almost insignificant as, as far as the length of the period of our lives. Now, that's not to say that life is not important, but is very brief and very temporary. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that when we die, we lose our consciousness. We do no longer have any active thought. We are, it says in, that, that our thoughts perish on the day that we die. Solomon says that we need to do what we need, be active and be productive now, because in the grave, there's no work, there's no, there's no knowledge, there's nothing that continues after we have died. And so life is brief, temporary, and when it's over, it's over. Okay. You quoted what Solomon wrote. That leads us to a, an inv- inevitable question that we've already been putting out here today. What about what are called near-death experiences that people claim to, to pass over and then they come back yes. to this physical life? What about those? Yes. Well, it's certainly a very mysterious uh, event that takes place in some people's lives. And first of all, I would not deny that it happened that they experienced something. They experienced something, and we can't deny that they had an experience. The question is, what did they experience? And I think that the important uh, thing to consider is that it is indeed a near-death experience. It's not quite death. It, yeah, it's not a death experience or an after-death experience. It is a near-death near experience. Uh, we understand, we know, that when a person is dying, then the blood, as we talked about earlier, stops circulating. The, the brain re- is no longer receiving uh, the oxygen that it needs, uh, and it begins to, to shut down. And this can lead to hallucinations. And when a person is, has a, what, is what they're calling a near-death experience, uh, it is the brain closing down, and, and they're beginning to misinterpret what they're seeing, and their thoughts are not in, no longer under control, and it basically uh, is a, an event that is a hallucination. Um, I have a good friend that I visited in the hospital uh, not too long ago, and, and this woman was very heavily medicated. And as I was talking to her, uh, seemingly a pretty normal conversation, she turned to the other side of the bed and started talking to her daughter. Only thing is, her daughter wasn't there. She was hallucinating. She thought she was convinced that her daughter was there. And a hallucination is a very powerful thing. Even later, she still w- insisted that, that I had been there at the same time as her daughter. Now, that's not a near-death experience, but the point is that a hallucination is very vivid and a person who experiences that is convinced that it happened. What we have to stop and consider is, do we believe what is most likely a hallucination and something that didn't really happen, or do we believe what the Bible says about death, which is that when we die, we do not have consciousness. And I would also add what we really don't understand. There are things that do take place within the human brain that that at that point in time that science doctors just do not completely understand but the Bible is very clear yes in teaching in terms of what does happen at death as exactly. we look at that as our standard all right scripture promises Don that the blackness of unconsciousness is not all that that we have to look forward to though we need to understand that that uh, when we look at the golden scripture of the Bible John 3:16, that, that does say that if we believe in Jesus Christ we will not perish but have everlasting life how do we get from this life to that everlasting life, from mortal temporary life 
to the eternal life God promises through Christ. You see, this is where the wrong teaching about the immortality of the soul is so confusing. There is something that we need to do in order to receive that gift of eternal life that God wants to give to us. Let's go back to the example again in Matthew chapter 19. The young man asked what he needed to do to receive eternal life. Jesus Christ told him what he needed to do, that there are things that he needed to do and involved obeying commandments right. in order to be able to receive eternal life. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says that it's not just those who, who say his name, say, Lord, Lord, who will receive eternal life, but it, it is those who do the will of the Father. So there is something that we must do in this life in order to receive the gift of eternal life that God wants to give to us. And I think that's probably the key thought here is that through this idea of the immortality of the soul, we are led to believe we already have eternal life when the Bible through these scriptures you've mentioned and many, many more that, we, mm -hmm. that this booklet, Heaven and Hell, goes into, uh, shows that we don't have it of ourselves. It's something that is the gift of God, Romans 6.23. Yes. Does the Bible tell us when we can expect to receive that promise of eternal life? It certainly does. In John chapter 5, Jesus speaks of a time in the future when the Father will call to those in the grave and they will hear his voice and come forth from the grave. And uh, if, if, there, if we already have an immortal soul, then, then who is in the grave? Uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense unless we, unless we are in the grave awaiting the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15... Uh, Paul explains that we will receive, uh, that he, he describes a resurrection to eternal life uh, at the time of the last trump or at the time when Jesus Christ returns. He says this mortal must put on immortality, this corrupt must put on incorruption, and we will at that point receive the gift of eternal life, and then we will be immortal souls. And then at that point we will have a whole other subject to go into in terms of man's purpose and plan. That, that resurrection offers a clear sign of hope. When we come back, we're going to wrap this thought up. It's been a challenging subject to get into and to discuss the myth of the immortal soul. We'll be right back. Stay with us. People all over the world ponder, is there a heaven or a hell? You need to understand from the Bible that nobody goes to an ever-burning hell at death. And where does the idea of the immortal soul come from? Call toll-free 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Or go to beyondtoday.tv for your free copy of Heaven and Hell, What Does the Bible Really Teach? So, do you still believe you have an immortal soul? Well, we've told you today, you don't. We have told you that the Bible shows us very clearly, clearly that only God has immortality. But the good news is He wants to share that eternal spirit life with you, with me, with all humanity. We are physical, composed of flesh, and we will die. The only way we can live forever is to follow Christ's teaching to repent. You can turn your life around and accept God's offer of eternal life. The choice is yours, and it will be a decision that will be for eternity. Don't put it off any longer. Choose God's way that you may live forever. Don, thanks for being with us on this program. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. When you're looking to understand your future, remember this program, Beyond Today. Thanks for watching. For the free literature offered on today's program, go online to beyondtoday.tv. Please join us again next week on Beyond Today.